Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to a conversation about diversity's role in student achievement. I am Chris Amundsen, the Executive Director of the National Association of State Boards of Education, and I'm delighted to be here today. Now, first, a public service announcement. You will notice that, yes, I am indeed wearing an I Voted sticker. That's because in Virginia, we think elections are so fun that we not only have a general election every year, but we have primaries just as often as we can. If you live in Virginia, you need to go vote. I do want to thank everyone who is here with us in the audience, as well as to everyone who is a virtual attendee. And I would like to note that the online audience makes up more than half of the total attendance today. So, whoa, yeah. Whether here or online, the people who have taken time to join this event are an impressive group and they include State Board of Education members, policy experts, researchers, professors, government officials, and students. Whether people are here or watching us, I know that many of you will be tweeting today's conversation. You can even tweet in your questions during the Q&A portion of the program. Please follow either at NASB or at education underscore air and use the hashtag EdDiversity. <clears throat> the panel discussion really came about because of a conversation that Kathleen Courier, AIR's Vice President for Communications, and I had last winter. We both agreed that our organizations had a, a, together a really wonderful combination of research and practice. And we thought that sharing, finding important topics where we could bring both of those sets of expertise to bear would be really worthwhile. And certainly, that is true of the issue of diversity's role in student achievement. In racially and socioeconomically diverse schools, research shows all students benefit. They develop skills for effective social engagement, critical thinking, problem solving, and collaboration. And regardless of income, ethnicity, race, or grade level, these students do better academically. Yet we know that many students attend racially and socioeconomically homogeneous schools. Today, segregation is not confined only to one geographic region of the country. Um, in fact, a recent University of California at, L at Los Angeles UCLA study found that black students are more segregated in New York Illinois, and California. Today, we want to talk about what we know about how students perform relative to st school diversity, and we want to share a presentation on some upcoming research. Where are the opportunity gaps in education? What are the factors that lead to these gaps? And most important, from our perspective as State Board of Education members, what can policymakers do to close those gaps? Now, I know that this topic has done nothing but get more and more important since Kathleen and I had that lunch last winter. In fact, if you, like me, start your day by reading compilations of education stories, you might be struck just in the last two days we saw reports on funding inequalities and discipline disparities and segregation and teacher issues. So it is a hot topic. We at NASB have highlighted the issue of differences in educational opportunity in our newest issue of the State Education Standard, and there are copies of it outside. We uh, wanted to explore how state policymakers could control and address many of the issues that lead to that disparity. And when we started to work on that issue, we knew there was one person that we wanted to write the lead article. Peter Cookson, and fortunately, he is also here as the moderator of today's panel. Peter is a researcher and the director of the Equity Project at AIR. His knowledge of schools and education comes from a lifetime of teaching, researching, and working to improve the quality of education for all children. He also continues to teach courses in educational policy, inequality, and social innovation at Georgetown University, and he's written or co-authored more than 15 books on education reform and policy. 
I had the wonderful but far too brief opportunity to work with him when our tenure at education sector overlapped. He's just a wonderful person who has devoted his entire career to issues related to educational opportunity and mobility. Please join me in welcoming Peter Cookson, the moderator of the panel, who will introduce the rest of the participants. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for that introduction. When Chris left uh, Ed Sector, I knew that uh, we would be leaving soon. All of us would have to leave because she was the heart and soul of it. Made me laugh, made me cry, and made me always know that whatever was happening was really important. So look, I'm Peter Cooks, and this is the topic. This is Chris framed this so well. Uh, I welcome you all, all of you who are in the room, all of you who are with us uh, virtually. It's going to be very, very exciting. I think there's over 300 of us that are involved in this. And I also want to thank, before I go, we get going any further, is to thank the folks both at NASB and AIR that made this possible. I'm looking for Diana. I don't know where she's in the room. Well, there's, she must be doing something important. Diana Hewn did this incredible job of pulling us all together. So I'd like to just say thanks to her. Um, so my role, my role is to act as a moderator, keep the conversation going. Uh, we'll have a chance after the panel talks to have questions, so we'll leave plenty of time for that. Chris also said if you want to ask a question on, on Twitter, it's, uh, it's uh, either uh, at education underscore AIR or at NASB uh, using uh, hashtag EdDiversity. You'll find descriptions of our panelists and our presenter in the program that you have there. So I think we're set to go. Uh, Chris did a great job in introducing it. Let me just put it this way to get uh, to sort of frame a little bit what Sammy's going to be doing. The issue of school composition and student achievement has a long and distinguished record of research. Uh, it attracted such scholars as Eric Hanischek at Harvard and Stanford and um, Russ Rumberger. They have been interested in how school composition affects achievement. Recent work by Roz Chetty, uh, the Harvard economist, has talked about place matters. And so today what we're going to be talking about is an aspect of that that's a little deeper and, and deals with the opportunity structure that young people have. Um, we're going to get some new research today uh, by one of our rising young stars here at AIR, Sammy. Sammy Kamitu is a principal researcher here at AIR. He's an economist. He is currently the project director for the National Evaluation of Magnet Schools and has done an amazing job in pulling all this complex data together. So please have me, join me in welcoming Sammy to our. So thank you, Peter. Um, so like Peter said, I'm principal analyst here at AIR. And so I'm, I'm currently engaged in some research looking at school composition and achievement and uh, was asked to make some introductory remarks and I really want to help set the stage for today's panel discussion um, with a few slides that present some of the statistics that motivates our research. And I wanna raise three questions um, that have been essential for us as we've been considering this issue. Specifically, one, what do we mean by diversity? Two, how might it be related to achievement? And three, um, is having a diverse school really enough or is there something more that we need to consider? So, so to start, as noted in the invite today's panel, um, the Civil Rights Project at UCLA has come out with reports that document segregation of students in the US. And this chart here is taken from their latest report, uh, which is titled Brown at 60, Great Progress, a Long Retreat in an Uncertain Future. And this chart depicts the trend in the amount of African-American students in what the authors call intensely segregated minority schools. And this illustrates one of the major points um, uh, of their um, report and motivation for our current research. And, and what this illustrates is that while there was a great decline in segregation from the 60s to the 80s, as seen in the left half of that chart, that trend has been reversed in recent decades. And that's what you see in the second and the right half. So the first issue I want to raise is, well, what do, I, what do we mean by diversity? Um, or what, what is a diverse school? So conceptually, segregation, the topic of the previous slide, is the opposite of diversity. 
Um, and for conducting research on school composition, we need to measure these ideas. And to do so, we need to be precise in our definitions. There is, however, no one way to measure these concepts. Um, but how we do so influences our results and conclusions. So starting with segregation, there are many mathematical formulations of segregation. But and most of them are relative to a particular geographic area whose population acts as a reference. So for example, the authors of Brown um, uh, at 60 uh, provide a point in example um, that illustrates why uh, this can be difficult or even problematic. So they ask us to consider a school in Detroit that is 90% black. Because the student population of Detroit is 90% black, this school will be considered under some segregation measures to be fully integrated or in other words, reflective of the city's population. In contrast, a school in Detroit that would be 50% black and 50% white would be considered segregated. Uh, so the authors of Brown and 60 advocate using for um, measures that are not relative in this sense. Uh, but this leads to a question at the other end of the spectrum. Um, and here the question is, well, what does a fully diverse school look like? Is it where a given measure of segregation is zero, or is it something else? And before I move on to the next slide, uh, sort of as an aside, this, this issue, this measurement issue, reminds us that schools operate in the context of larger social forces, in particular, separate from educational policy, uh, decades of social, economic, and political factors have led to local areas where minorities are highly concentrated. And this then is reflected in the local schools. And as many researchers have noted, if we're concerned about segregation in schools, we can't ignore these other factors. So taking a look at some more statistics, um, so here's a look at school composition um, using recent data as reported in Brown at 60. So if students were evenly distributed across schools, the school composition would look like this pie chart in the middle of the slide. So now let's look at school composition for the average student uh, from a few different racial ethnic groups. So you can see in particular here uh, how the average school for a white student in the upper left <coughs> looks much different than the school for the average black student in the upper right, and how these are both different from the pie chart in the middle. So bringing achievement into the discussion, uh, here's some data from the National Assessment of Edu Education Progress uh, from their Data Explorer. And it illustrates uh, one of our motivations for our current inquiry into school composition. And what this shows is that achievement in schools with higher percentages of minority students is lower. But in thinking about this relationship, um, this has led us to the basic question, well, why might school composition matter? Um, and so researchers have examined this from uh, a, a number of angles and, uh, and a number of reasons. So first, race, racial ethnic isolation is correlated with the isolation of low socioeconomic status students. And the authors of Brown at 60 refer to this as double segregation. Uh, second, researchers have looked at the une uneven distribution of key academic supports across schools. So for example, schools that serve large percentages of minority students are more likely to employ less experienced teachers. Uh, researchers have also looked into differential treatment of minority students. Uh, here I summarize some of this in uh, with the phrase low expectations for minority students, but this manifests in a number of different ways, including the placement of minority students on lower academic tracks, starting as early as elementary school, curricula focused on basic skills rather than advanced thinking, and, the, and at the high school level, how college prep courses are less often offered in schools with high minority concentrations. Uh, a separate type of differential treatment that's been researched is the use of school discipline. Minority students face a disproportionate amount of school discipline reports, and that gap increases as the concentration of minority students in, in a school increases. And some research has also investigated sociological reasons. Um, a a well-known and controversial one is oppositional culture, which is thought to be greater in more segregated schools. And this is a sociological theory uh, primarily attributed to John Ogbu. And the hypothesis, hypothesis is that certain behaviors that are associated with high achievement are shunned by minority students as they seek to cope with identity formation in the context of the history of racism in this country. And finally, um, researchers have examined how diversity benefits all students. And a 2010 synthesis of prior, prior research, for example, found that students of all socioeconomic statuses, races, ethnicities, and grade levels are likely to have higher mathematics performance if they tend socioeconomically 
in racially integrated schools. Um, and so there's a final issue that I want to raise is, um, is this, is diversity enough or is, it, is there something more that we need to consider? And first, most concretely, um, uh, even if you have a diverse school, uh, there are concerns about within school segregation that researchers have looked at. And this could negate any benefits that one would think one might think would come from having a diverse school. Uh, researchers have looked into segregated uh, classrooms and segregated peer groups. Uh, but second, um, given that we, all, again, given that we have a diverse student body in the nation, in the state, in some schools, how much does it matter what is done in practice with that diversity? And to quote one paper that states this problem succinctly, the presence of diverse students does not necessarily equal diversity in education. On the one hand, there are bans on ethnic studies, such as in Arizona. And on the other hand, there are people who believe in the importance of curriculum practices that are culturally responsive. And for us, this raised uh, a, a very basic issue is, what do we think is the purpose of education? And reflecting on that, what's the role of diversity in that purpose? So that's it. And, um, those are my remarks, and I really look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Sammy. That really, that really got us off to a great start. Why don't I invite the panelists to come up and uh, take, a, take a seat? Um, I think that was, some of that data was really actually quite fascinating, and we'll try to build around it a little bit. Um, so have your questions ready. Um, all right. So let me, uh, you have the program, so I'm not going to spend too much time uh, introducing every, everybody, but I'll just say a few words. On the, facing on your left um, is uh, Kim Karras. She's director of NASB School Climate, uh, Discipline, and Equity Portfolio. She provides strategic direction for the organization's advocacy work uh, to ensure that all students require, receive equal educational opportunities. S sitting next to Kim is Chris Barlich. He is the president of the Virginia Board of Education. He was appointed in 2011 by Governor Robert McDonald, and Chris was elected president of the Board of Education in February of 2014. And next to me is Letitia Smith-Evans, senior counsel, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Letitia has, is one of the country's leading civil rights authorities. She is a strong proponent of using multi-stakeholder approaches to closing educational gaps. So let's start with Letitia. Um, so they have about, you have about somewhere around 10 minutes. So we'll, we'll go through and um, ask you a couple questions. But let me just start off. Uh, you saw Sammy's uh, data. Uh, you probably have looked at data like this a little bit before. It's probably not really um, uh, totally new to you. What, uh, what do you think accounts for some of this variation, school composition or student composition? But what other variables, and how do you look at this issue? Thank you for that question. Can you hear me? Great. OK, thank you very much for the question. And thank you, Sammy, for the wonderful presentation. I thought it was uh, extremely helpful. And yes, we have seen this data before, but it was put together in a very compelling way that really tells the story. I appreciate the provocative questions. Um, and I will address those as well as answer yours in a moment. Um, but just to reiterate, Sammy asked, what do we mean by diversity? What does it look like? What is the goal? And is having a quote unquote diverse school really enough? So I'd just like to briefly start by saying um, he shared data from a report on the 60th anniversary of Brown, and we've just come up on the 61st anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court decision. And we know that that decision has come, that, that anniversary is not quite a decade past the election of the first African-American president. Um, with, the, with that factor, a number of folks think that race doesn't matter. And we know, based on the data that Sammy showed us and other data, that it really does. When we talk about diversity, it's important to recognize that it's really not just about the numbers, and it's not just about what the school looks like on paper. So data may actually show that a school is racially diverse, but without a greater understanding of what's going on inside the school's walls, we really should not assume that diversity is actually embraced. Um, True appreciation for diversity is actually demonstrated when an educational institution ensures that all students, irrespective of race or other identifying factor, have meaningful, 
access to high quality and equal educational opportunities. And we know that data from the civil rights data collection, the most recent iteration of it that's public, show that all students don't actually have meaningful access or the same access to resources. For example, some students don't have the same access to STEM courses in classes, in schools. In addition, as Sammy mentioned, uh, there are issues with respect to discipline, and I know my fellow panelists, um, Kimberly, will address that as well. But we know that students are suspended, and African American students in particular are suspended at rates nearly three times their white peers. Um, and we also know that research shows that that disparity does not exist because students are misbehaving more. So. We're, when we look at what is going on inside school walls, it's critically important to understand uh, what, how diversity is appreciated and whether or not it is appreciated. In addition, I just want to touch base on efforts that folks throughout the country, school boards, school districts undertake. For example, Many districts are interested in pushing for magnet schools, and we have thought that's a great thing. Historically, magnet schools have been used as a tool to desegregate schools um, and really came about strong in the 1970s. However, there are some magnet schools known as a school within a school, for example, that have been shown, research shows, actually are highly racially isolated. So when we look at school data, for example, where there is a magnet school within a larger public school, and uh, we may see that the school looks diverse, but that may not account for what's going on inside the school, which is that there's a, there's a highly racialized, um, racially isolated magnet school existing within those walls. So some, those are some of the things that I wanted to comment on. Uh, cool. For now, I have more to say later. Actually, let me say one more thing first. <laughs> um, I, I, just, I don't want to take up too much time. Oh, you're but, good, you're good. Uh, okay, okay. Um, I just want to say that this work is incredibly difficult. I appreciate everyone here being in the room and all the folks who are listening to this conversation online because uh, it is not easy just to take a look at the data and the things that all of us will discuss and say, I've got a quick fix to this. There needs to be a greater appreciation for the fact that these problems have stemmed largely regarding uh, racially, racial discrimination and, and other issues <clears throat> pertaining to diversity because they come on the heels of 375 years of legalized racial segregation in the, in the United States. So as we look to remedies and ways to address some of these problems, it's critically important to understand that. As we look to our colleagues in other countries, such as Finland um, and other places that may seem to be doing these things well and making sure that students are achieving at high rates, make sure that you understand that our history is a little bit different so that we are facing challenges that not everyone faces today. Yeah. Well, let me just uh, ask you this one question. I don't want to oversimplify this. You gave us such a great presentation. You showed the complexity and the interactions between all these things. But if you had to do one thing, sure. what would it be? What would be the one thing, policy or school improvement that you would choose? Okay. Um, I think I think the thing that's most important for all stakeholders to do, so whether they're policymakers, lawmakers, teachers, educators, parents, and students, is to really listen and learn, and to actually be open to the fact that we may not have no one person or one group may hold the answer to how to figure this out. I think there are so many different moving parts that it's critically important to actually engage in multi-stakeholder efforts that involve respecting and appreciating what the knowledge that all these stakeholders have to bring to the table. Yeah. I so, know that may seem kind of pie in the sky, but well, that's, that's well, the truth. Well, no, I think what you're saying is, is that this is a, a larger, there's a kind of a grassroots piece to this that sometimes gets left out of these policy discussions. Right. That, that, I think that's true. I think, I think it's critically important to understand and embrace a school community, which is not just teachers and students. It's, it's the entire community that's there, parents included, businesses, and other folks. Um, and I also think it's imperative that we not be afraid of data, regardless of what it tells us, because without understanding uh, the data, and I say that quantitative data is just as important and, as qualitative data, because quantitative will tell you the numbers, but qualitative tells you the story behind those numbers. And it's really important to embrace those and the entire community to embrace them. So school systems, districts should not be afraid to share that data, because only then will we all be able to engage in an effort to make change. Have you seen some place where it works best? 
I, I have seen many places that are working diligently, and uh, I won't mention any names right now, but there are places that are working diligently in various areas. So Sammy mentioned discipline. There are some folks that are doing a great job with respect to that out in a small district in California. Um, and there are other folks who are looking specifically at the achievement piece so that when you address some of these disparities, racial disparities, for example, pertaining to discipline, achievement actually goes up. Excellent. Thank you so much, Satish. That was really, that was a great way to start. Kim, um, I'm going to turn to you next. Um, you've been very interested in say, state policy options for closing the achievement gap. Um, in this thinking, when you look at these options, how important is school composition? And I'll come back with a couple other questions, or we can start with that one if that works for you. Thank you, Peter, for that question. And Sammy, thank you for your presentation. Um, well, so um, one of the things that we're working on at NASB, um, we're focusing on school discipline and school climate. Um, and we believe that a supportive school climate and supportive discipline helps students to reach their maximum potential um, academically, socially, and behaviorally. Um, and so we know that there are several state policy options for closing opportunity and achievement gaps. Um, at NASB, we're always thinking about what those policy levers may be for state boards of education and how we can use those to um, address some of these issues. Um, at NASB, we also act as brokers of information, so we're always looking to share research on best practices um, and best policies around these different issues. Uh, we started in this work um, in around 2012. Um, we started working with several of our um, state board members and state departments of education to address school climate um, and discipline issues. And at that time, we kind of understood that our members were maybe not, most of them were not really at a place where they were ready to do um, a state overhaul um, in this area. Um, but so we kind of led them along gradually and um, we allowed them to tell us where they were at. And from that point, we decided that you know we would support them in their efforts. Um, but we're kind of entering in the second phase of our work um, with support from Open Society Foundations, and we are really looking for our states to focus on data collection. Um, we want them to understand the importance of state-level data collection and the importance of highlighting what is being done well in districts and also um, noting districts that need improvement and that are struggling. Um, so. With that, you know, we, we um, spend a lot of time sharing information with our members about best practices, um, reports such as Breaking School Rules by Council of State Governments, um, the Research Practice Collaborative briefing papers has been very helpful to our members, and also um, the Civil Rights Data Collection reports. And we know that even though our members need to know about this information, they need to know what's happening across the country, uh, sometimes it doesn't really hit home until they see the data in their states. And so it's not just enough for us to tell them that there's an achievement gap that exists, that um, African-American students are being suspended three times, three to four times more than uh, white students. They need to see the data in their states, and they also need to not be afraid to closely examine that data, as my colleague uh, Leticia said. Um, and so we're pushing for that. We're um, actually um, in the process of creating a national uh, online database of the indicators that states use to identify um, school climate and discipline issues. And what we found is quite a few states are collecting a great deal of data um, around attendance, graduation rates, um, dropout rates, um, CTE enrollment, um, law enforcement referrals, peer mediation programs, uh, parent counseling, and also disaggregating uh, discipline data by incident types and race. Um, but what we want them to do beyond the collection and review of that data is to actually um, tell us or be able to demonstrate what their technical assistance plan is. So when they see data or they see a district that is struggling or they see another one that's doing well, we want to know what, what's your plan for supporting this work. And we, we so greatly appreciate the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Justice's school discipline guidance that came out um, 
it was released early last year that lays out, it clearly lays out what districts and schools need to do to avoid any type of investigation for discriminatory discipline. Um, so we appreciate that. But we at NASB believe that by the time the federal government has identified a problem within the state, the state has missed an opportunity. They missed many opportunities to deal with these issues. And because they've missed that, then we can we can conclude that too many children have also missed opportunities to learn because of, you know, being pushed out of school for exclusionary dis discipline, having dropped out, coming in contact with the juvenile justice system. And so we're really passionate about um, our state boards of education, partnering with departments of education and other experts within the state and within the field at the national level to address these issues, to work together, to develop technical assistance plans to avoid um, situations like, uh, you know, DOJ or, or Department of Ed coming in and, and doing something to overhaul. So with that, we spend a lot of time at NASB. Um, you know, first of all, we respect the fact that our states are, are different places. Um, they run the political spectrum. Um, most of them fall kind of um, in the middle, um, but we're, we're sensitive to that. And so we work hard to show them how um, discipline data, school climate and discipline data, also impacts the other issues that are important to them. And I think that's very important in our um, type of advocacy work, I'll call it. Um, so we need to show them how discipline impacts graduation rates and, and how it impacts um, students' preparation for college and career. Uh, also, how it impacts school safety and that school resource officers don't necessarily need to be used or actually should not be used for disciplinary um, infractions, but they should be used in a way to support um, the, school, the school environment to keep it safe um, and understanding the difference. Um, also, um, we want our, our members to kind of look at different policy levers, to examine them closely, to think of them more creatively and more strategically, um, think about teacher equity a little bit a little bit more um, in terms of um, how they allocate resources for teacher preparation, um, for recruitment and retention. We would like to see more resources going to teachers that are willing to teach in high need schools with high need students, um, providing them with the training and the professional development that they need. Uh, also, um, policy levers that um, look at school climate and all the dimensions of school climate, so school safety, suspension, um, drug and alcohol abuse, um, teacher and student interactions, and so on and so forth. So we spend a lot of time sharing information with our members and encouraging them to look at policy in creative um, and strategic ways. Well, thank you. That was really great. Let me ask you a question and take us home here a little bit. Um, so I'm a principal of a high school somewhere in America, and you come and you talk to me about these data. So I live there. I, you know, I see. I think I know what's going on in my school. What actually happens when you present these data? What do I, as a principal, or I could be a superintendent, whatever, what do I actually do with this? I think that when people talk about data, so there's kind of a, a little bit different world. There's the world of being in the school with the students, the, uh, the emotional pitch, the school climate, all the things that go on in schools. Schools are emotional environments. And so someone says, but you need to look at the data, Peter, and the data shows you what, what do you want me to do? What would you say, what would you recommend that I do? Um, if you were a principal? What? what would I, if you were a principal, yeah, what just would I recommend? Anybody you're talking to, I just picked a principal because they're in the school, but could be. Well, um, so, well, if it's quantitative data, like Leticia said earlier, I think qualitative is just important as quantitative, and you need that story behind the data to understand what's going on. Um, as a principal, I would um, put together focus groups um, around, like, within the school community um, with teachers, students, parents, um, community leaders, um, get input from all of the stakeholders that are involved, um, and then work from there. But I have a plan. Well, ideally, you would be able to look to um, the state for support. Um, well, well, I think for a principal, they would need to look to their school district leader. Um, and then, you know, hopefully the district has received guidance from the state on how to address those issues. 
All right, thank you. That was great. And that's a perfect segue because we have somebody from the state who uh, is uh, president of the Board of Education in Virginia. And Virginia is a, a large uh, multicultural state. And um, I'm sure, Chris, um, you have a lot to say on it. So I'm going to turn it over to you and take us, take us forward about what, what are you going to do at that level, your level of the way you see the school from your level, the, the, this issue of diversity's role in student achievement and what you've done and what you'd like to do and what you think some of the possibilities are and what are some of the problematics? Well, I'm thinking my role here is to be the Greek chorus and uh, to just sort of say, like, E-R, oh, woe is me. Um, I, what struck me about one of those slides, uh, I was elected to a local school board 20 years ago, and I was looking at one of your slides, Sammy, that, that talked about um, lower expectations for minority students, different resources, lower resources for schools that are dominated by, by uh, poor kids. And it was like a bad flashback because it was all stuff that I saw 20 years ago in Fairfax County, Virginia. Um, we made some efforts to try to change that. We, we took away the right of schools to be able to say, you have to do certain things to take advanced placement courses. We encouraged students to take those courses international baccalaureate courses. We revised some of the local funding to make certain that there were additional programs in, in local uh, schools that were particularly challenged. And we looked at the, at the 20 worst performing schools in the school system and said, they're going to get these additional resources. And by the way, the community is going to decide how to do this. Now, that's at the local level. Um, the state level, it's a different, it's a different story, and I, I think maybe we should have had a state legislator here as well, because at the end of the day, uh, I don't know if, if uh, I don't know if other states are like us, uh, but we struggle in Virginia with a with a clause in our constitution that says uh, local schools are supervised by the local school district, and there's a 40 year case history that says they have absolute control over curriculum, personnel, budgets, and facilities. All right. We can't interfere. State can't interfere. Local governing authorities can't interfere. So the result is that is that the state board and the state department of education you know, can provide uh, the best practices, can provide the research, can provide the professional development. We've designed a climate survey to be used in school systems. We can't make them use it. Uh, and that becomes a challenge because the ones that need to use it the most don't. Um, one of the things we're looking at uh, at the board level, we're undergoing an entire revision of our standards of accreditation, uh, which in the past have been largely based on test scores. Uh, we're looking a little more organically at, at some of the other factors. And we're looking at things like climate surveys. We're looking at things like um, extracurricular activities. Um, you know, one of th this is not, in my view, this is not just a race issue. This is a socioeconomic issue. Uh, if you look at uh, um, recent articles by everyone from from conservatives like Charles Murray to progressives like Robert Putnam, they've they've all suggested that there is a growing divide between uh, the resources available uh, to to children in the in the upper income areas and those in the lower income areas, and they have a lot to do with social capital uh, that that. They don't get at the schools. It's, it's a matter of communities. There's a decline in the number of people involved in community organizations, decline in the number of uh, uh, people attending uh, church functions, uh, a decline across the board. And the question is, how do you, how do you make that up? Um, you know, the, the child living in northern Virginia in the Langley community has a parent to take them to T-ball. The child who is not, who is living maybe in Petersburg or Richmond, not only may not have a parent available to take them to t-ball, probably doesn't have a, a t-ball function. Um, and so they end up, when they get to class, when they get to school, not having experienced things like teamwork, not having experienced things like leadership, uh, not having experienced a new mentor uh, that can help guide them through some of the issues that they have to be guided through. And then, it, and then it becomes to the school. So one of the things we're looking at is this issue of, you know, what kind of extracurriculars do schools offer? Uh, how, what is the level of participation in those extracurriculars? Um, those are the things that, that deal with soft skills that are valued by employers and um, that are valued in society, I think. Uh, but our ability to impose on, on local school divisions becomes 
a little dicey, and that's one of our struggles. It's been one of my frustrations, both as a member of the board and as, as president of the board, to be able to, to say, you know, this is what you really need to do, and then they say, well, we don't have the money to do it. Yeah. Because in Virginia, local school boards don't have taxing authority. Um, the state um, theoretically provides about 40 to 50 percent, but in, but but in reality, it's far less than than actually is being spent in these school divisions. So the reality, when the when when the boots get on the ground, when we're operating up at the 10,000 foot mark, is how do you make it work? Um, and and what we're struggling with is. How do we make it work by setting the parameters? And um, if we don't have a hammer to, to slam down on people, which we don't, and which probably isn't a good idea, uh, can we put enough batteries in the flashlight to shine the way? All right, that's a really, that was a really good uh, presentation about some of the limitations of making this work. We're going to open it up to everybody in a few minutes, but I have a, I, I, I have a couple, well, one question really for the for the panel before we do that. Um, you know. Data from the Southern Education Foundation indicated that more than half of public school students in the United States are eligible for reduced or, or free lunch. That means there's a measure of poverty that more than half of the kids in the United States are poor. Um, and in some of the states, the numbers are really high. You know, in the South and places are really high. Along with that, we have a demographic transition that's happening in this country that is real. Um, we are becoming a multicultural society. Um, and it's, it's not just local, it's not just in our pocket, it's really throughout the country, not only because of, of the folks that have been here for a while, but also immigrants and folks that are coming from around the world. So the way the United States looks in many ways is different than it was when uh, people were writing books about educational policy in even 1990 even or something like that. So that's a preface to a question that I have for all of you. And I'll start with Letitia and we'll just go down the line here. You know, how do we celebrate diversity? It's, you know, student achievement, when you look at schools, it's the, it's the culture of the schools, it's the excitement in the schools, it's the connection of the teachers to the students, it's the passion and the dedication. And how do we talk about diversity? I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it all sounds a little bit like a problem. How do we turn it into a possibility and something that really would, would transform the schools in a, in a deep way, given the fact that this is who we are today and we will certainly be this way tomorrow? Thank you for that question. Uh, I think you kind of answered it, right? So you ce you're celebrating it. It's something that you respect, respect and that you appreciate. Um, and I just, I just wanted to say one quick thing about socioeconomic status diversity and, and racial diversity. Both are critically important, but please understand that um, even when you're controlling for socioeconomic status, uh, mm -hmm. there are still racial disparities sure. in education. Um, so we still see that. And it's important to look at that. Uh, there are school systems, um, back to your question about what we do, how we respect and appreciate it. There are school systems or districts that do have the power, for example, to allocate funding that they receive from the state. And when you look at the allocation, you will see that high minority, quote unquote, schools uh, receive significantly less money than uh, you know schools that are predominantly white. And so, and the entire school system may be all Title I. So the entire school system is poor, but when you look and see how the money's allocated, you see that there are schools that are not receiving the same amount of money and that that breaks down along racial lines. So I think it's critically important to continue to see, con continue to consider both. Um, but really embracing, embracing diversity is just, it's demonstrated when you can see that folks are trying to address issues. If there are concerns about data, they're asking questions, like people shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. What does this look like? They may be developing plans, and when they develop a plan, if it doesn't work, they develop another one, or, or they continue to look at these issues. Um, and that, that's what I think. All right, well, that's a good answer. Uh, Chris, what do you think about that? I think there's a there's a growing generation for which the issue it's it's it becomes if they've grown up in a diverse area it's second nature, um, and I think that's that's part of the thing. I mean, my kids grew up in a school that is now probably forty percent or more than that non-white. To them, having having African American friends, Hispanic friends, it's it's second nature. It is just part of their life. 
we've got relatives who did not grow up in that. And so for them, it's, it's a whole other experience. Um, I think schools do a, a, at least the schools I'm familiar with, do a fairly good job of trying to do that to trying to celebrate diversity, trying to make clear to students that we all have something to contribute. Um, I think the problem is, is, the, is the generation that was before those kids. Uh, I have, I've met a fellow who was a, who, a, a local school board member who told me, he happens to be black, um, who told me that his daughters had been pathed by their guidance counselors into a non-college track. Um, Fairly recently, not not yesterday, but fairly recently, they are now teachers. Um, they never told their father, who was who was on the school board at the time. Um, they never told him. But I think that's part of the problem. I think it's part of that lower expectations that we've got to overcome. Once we have the same expectations or even higher expectations, I think it starts to starts to take care of itself. Right. I don't think the country can afford, just on an economic basis, to operate the way it's operating because there's all this loss of talent. If you think about it in the larger context and just thinking from that, Kim, uh, what, what do you think about this? <laughs> Um, so, so I would say that, you know, I appreciate this conversation that we're having today. I think it's, it's very open and, and it's honest. And, and I think that those of us working on these issues need to be, um, we need to be bold. We need to be courageous. We need to be willing to challenge our colleagues. We need to be challenging one another, policymakers at the federal and the state level, teachers, principals. We need to um, challenge them. If, if we say we're about equal opportunities, um, for all students in education, then our policies and our practices need to reflect that. I think we also need to be willing to look at our own biases, and they exist in the African American communities as well as you know white communities, and I'm sure probably almost every other ethnic and racial group. Um, but we need to look at that. We need to kind of examine our implicit biases and and face that. I think we need to face ourselves. And um, there's an organization. Um, I think it's out in. Uh, the Midwest somewhere, but it's um, called Facing History and Facing Ourselves. I think we need to start with us and be honest with ourselves and how we really feel about children and people in general and be willing to um, just open our hearts and our minds to really understand people and to work with them and meet them where they're at. And also understanding that not everyone um, has had maybe the same experiences or perspectives that we have as individuals and just being open to accept that. That was great. I mean, yes, I was going to say, before we turn to the audience, if anybody wants to, Letitia, would you like to say something? I just wanted to uh, piggyback off what my uh, two fellow panelists just said. And um, I think we also need to appreciate that it that students and teachers, educators are affected by things that go on, go on outside of the classroom as well. So part of this, I think, is... Um, in appreciation for the fact that you've got multiple generations involved in quote unquote this issue and solving this problem uh, is appreciating what what is going on in the country. Um, you have to appreciate and create a space for dialogue surrounding things that happen, um, whether we're talking about Ferguson, New York City, Ohio, or places and things that happen that will affect students that are in the classroom. I think that is imperative as we talk about respecting and appreciating diversity as well. All right. Anybody else on the, before we turn it, anybody want to have the last comments? Well, first off, thank you very much. I think this was one of the uh, open, candid, fantastic sort of framing the, what we had with, with Sammy presented us. But now we're going to open it up to the audience. And uh, you'll raise your hand. There's uh, some folks in there who will we'll, uh, ask them, uh, bring the mic. But we also have uh, people who might want to ask questions on Twitter. To remind you, it's uh, at education underscore AIR at NASB using hashtag EdDiversity. So um, let's, let's, get, let's get rolling with the questions. Um, this lady right here would be fine. Hi, thank you so much. Maybe Bill. identify yourself. And uh, My name is Joyce L. Cunningham, and I'm at the US Department of Education. Um, something that came up, uh, not only in the research that was presented, but then a few panelists uh, also mentioned it was tracking. And I'm wondering, and also the, the adverse effects of tracking, particularly on communities of color, um, why do you think that this hasn't been uh, discussed uh, as 
as much uh, when we're talking about diversity and student achievement and outcomes. Um, why hasn't tracking, uh, particularly early tracking in, uh, in early or middle levels, uh, been discussed as also uh, an area where uh, students, particularly students of color, um, do not receive equal access? All right, it's a good question. Anybody want to on the panel want to tackle that question? about tracking. By the way, Sammy, you're more than welcome to join in any of this. So anybody? Kim? I can just say quickly that I can say that at LDF, that's a problem that we have looked at extensively. There's been extensive litigation surrounding that, particularly from decades ago. Um, it's something now that we really look at when we're talking about gifted and talented access. We're talking, uh, we, we look at um, who actually even knows about, about these classes, who has access to them, uh, what parents are informed about the availability of them. We see within the same school system sometimes that certain schools treat the program differently, so they will accept students into the program differently as opposed to other schools, thereby, quote unquote, limiting the opportunities for some students. Um, we look at this also all the way up through high school as we look at access to specialized programs, whether it's specialized schools or magnet schools. Um, and so all that kind of falls under tracking, and it is an issue that people are talking about, they just may not be using the word tracking. Um, I can think people think that's a bad word, but that really is happening, and I appreciate the question because it's happening a lot, um, and it doesn't need to be happening. Yeah. So. That's a good answer. Anybody uh, well, I was just going to, I think you're right. I mean, I think it's tracking, but no one's using the word, yeah. so no one thinks of it in those terms. I mean, I was shocked to, to find that there are, having 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 abandoned the the requirement in in Fairfax County that to take advanced placement courses you had to have a certain GPA and I, I was shocked to find out that there are huge numbers of places that that when I got on the state board that still require those GPAs and and if you've been a struggling student all along who is a bright student who who wants to stretch themselves and you're told no it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy at every at every step of the way I, I think part of the issue too is is not in terms of tracking but in terms of of uh, no, I've lost my thoughts so go okay, ahead no problem no problem Kim did you want to you good with this or you uh, Okay, all right, good. Let's take another question. Let's keep them fairly brief. Um, let's see, I said someone in the back. I see a hand back there. Anyone back there would be fine? Sure. And by the way, is there anybody, you're gonna raise your hand if there's anybody on Twitter? Okay, wonderful. Go ahead. Uh, Luann McNabb with the National Council of Teachers of English. Uh, my kids attended a very large, diverse high school in western Fairfax County, and they self-reported that, yes, there was segregation within the lunchroom and the hallways, and my son, who took AP classes, said it was very white. But what I did see was diversity in our arts, our performing arts, our visual arts, and our athletic teams, and I was wondering, have you looked at that as a role to get kids to mix together? Because that's those, those aspects were truly diverse, especially in a time where we're cutting back on the arts and athletics. All right, thank you very much. Who would like to tackle that question? It, it, uh, um, uh, well, you know, you know, you know, Kim, since you didn't do the last question yet, we're volu I'm volunteering for this one. Okay, so yeah, I think that that, that is a good place to start um, to bring more integration, to integrate um, more students but I don't think it should necessarily end there. It kind of, you know, we, we need to have more integration in our academic classes. Um, we need to have more minorities um, with access to honors courses and, and that sort of thing. But I do appreciate, you know, that concept, that idea. I think it's a good one. Um, and I will just leave it at that. All right, well, does anybody else want to tackle that question at all? I actually Okay, yes, go ahead, of course. Um, which is that, a piece of what happens when you in it, when you have a really highly integrated band program, for example, uh, which is where you're going to have all your leaders in your school, is that then what that means is those kids are very likely to take English at the same time and math at the same time. So actually there's a great deal of academic integration that happens as a direct result, particularly of those co-curricular classes, chorus, band, and theater. Um, when, they, when they get to be really diverse and reflective of the student body, of necessity, then those kids are going to move together into other classes. So it's just a, it's a, it's an unintended, really positive consequence. 
Thank you. That was good. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. That's great. Did you want to? There's another question in the back. Uh, okay. Hi, Elizabeth Schneider with the Alliance for Excellent Education. And I had a related and follow-up question for Sammy, which is how are you controlling for um, the within school diversity or lack of diversity, segregation? I mean, it's exciting to see the finding. I mean, the reason probably so many of us is he are here is because of the finding that, oh, diversity actually has a correlation to student achievement. But have you been able to control? And how are you controlling for the in-school segregation, even if the school itself is diverse? Do you want to come up here, or, or why don't you use the mic, Sam? A big. Sorry. Oh, um. Okay, sorry. Well, just to clarify, um, the the what I what I presented was not um, my own research. It was it was the background and motivation for research that I'm in, and, and that research isn't hasn't isn't finished yet. Um, and, and so I'm going to try and recall what um, I remember from. So, so one of the one of the findings that I talked about in terms of diversity was, um, uh, it was a synthesis of previous literature, um, and that was that was the finding that I um, reported about mathematics and that students of all types um, perform better in mathematics when they're in diverse schools, and that was a synthesis of literature. So. Um, I would say that the the literature that that study used that synthesized was literature that used statistical techniques to control for a lot of the other factors that you think might you know confound the result. Um, but I don't know. I can't say off the top of my head whether any of them um, controlled for within school segregation or not. So sorry. Right. Oh, good. Thank yeah. you, Sammy. Thanks. You, yes. Go ahead. Uh, Green. Make one comment um, it, that dovetail with the last two questions. There is a system about a year ago. I requested data for a school from a school system and asked specifically for data pertaining to students who were in classes, like each class. So when I looked at the data for Algebra Two, for example, it looked like overall it was a diverse set of folks taking classes. This is a predominantly you know, part white and black district. Those are the two predominant races in the school system. And I was like, this is great. But when I looked at the classes, there were two sections and one section, I kid you not, was all white and one section was all black. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, this is the same class. So I asked, is the curriculum different? <laughs> they said, no, it's the same curriculum. How did this happen? Oh, I don't know, this is computerized. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, and I, and, you know, I'm not a computer whiz or anything, but you're not gonna tell me that you got 15 white students in one class and 15 black students in other class and a computer was responsible. So when I think about the, you know, the some students are traveling with, with each other from class to class or because of the, the classes that they take, something is wrong and there has to be a deeper look. So I'm not sure it would take a lot, I think, of research, you know, following up on the question that you asked Sammy to make sure, have a better understanding of actually what's happening in the classroom, you know, and in the schools with yeah. respect to that. You know, that, that example really brings it home really brings it home because there's all these ideas out there, but when it gets into actual practices, what really happens? I think that we have some questions. Do we have some questions on the Twitter? Sorry, yes, and the live stream is up again. Um, one question from Twitter, given that the US is a multicultural society, how can we attain a more culturally responsive education system? Uh, I didn't quite catch the last part of that. <laughs> So given that the U.S. is a multicultural society, how can we attain a more culturally responsive education system? Okay, more culturally responsive education system. Anybody on uh, the panel here want to uh, jump in on this? It's a pretty big question, but I think it's framing this larger issue of a multicultural uh, environment and society. Sounds kind of like the question yeah, it's a little bit like that question. Does anybody want to jump in on that or not? Uh, maybe not. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> okay. It Listen, like whoever question. sent that question, we really appreciate it. We, uh, uh, <laughs> is there any other Twitter questions that we can respond to? I'm a little embarrassed. So go ahead. Anybody else? No, there's another very similar one. <laughs> okay, all right. Listen. Uh, I just want to say it's, uh, that question was very similar, um, and I think a number of us answered that question earlier, so just to be respectful of the tweet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was good. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Maybe uh, my friend Rick over there maybe have a question. This is going to be a tough one on the panel, so um, brace yourself. Uh, 
uh, Richard Collenberg with the Century Foundation. So I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, NASB and AIR is taking on this issue. It's, it's so important. Um, and Peter, you had asked the question about kind of what uh, practical next steps. And I want to throw out one idea and get the panel's reaction. There are about 80 school districts throughout the country that look at the socioeconomic status of students in deciding how students are assigned to school. Uh, and these range from Cambridge, Massachusetts, to Champaign, Illinois, to Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, the, the idea is, is twofold. First, that as a legal matter, there are now, unfortunately, constraints that the Supreme Court has laid down on using race in student assignment. And secondly, that as an academic matter, uh, the research always suggested that the reason that African American students did better in integrated schools had nothing to do with the, the pigment of the classmates, um, but rather that it's a, an advantage for economically disadvantaged students to be in a economically mixed schools where where there are uh, stronger teachers on average, where parents are in a position to be actively involved, and where the, the peers and the classmates uh, expect to go on to college and, and serve as, as positive peer models. So I'm wondering what, what you all think of that idea of, of socioeconomically integrating schools through, uh, and I'm talking about, you know, through public school choice, not through, because people always think busing, you know, compulsory busing, but through magnet schools and, and choice. All right. Good. You want to, you look like you're going to answer that question. Go ahead. No, you start and then we can go. go, go. Quick thing. Good to see you again. And uh, we've sat together at many tables before in the past discussing these issues. And I appreciate and respect uh, the fact that socioeconomic diversity is critically important as well. I uh, still stand by the fact that racial diversity is also just as important. And it benefits not only students of color, but also white students as well. And uh, just remember that there is research that shows when you do control for socioeconomic diversity that you still see a racial achievement gap. So you cannot forget that that does, that does exist. Um, and also, I know you mentioned, you know, Massachusetts, there are places in Chicago and other places that have looked very closely at some of this. But every place is so, so unique and every place is very different. So I think it's important that we not think that there's one way to look at and address this problem that we're talking about today. And perhaps there are, there are um, student assignment programs and plans that can be uh, centered around socioeconomic diversity. And yes, the Supreme Court did limit your ability to con consider an individual student's race and assignment, but you may take account of racial demographics, which is permissible under that same case. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. Oh, that's good. Chris Chris, you touched on this, so maybe you want to get into it. Well, and, and I was going to say, I mean, part of the issue, too, I think, is that there are huge numbers of school districts where you cannot divert. I mean, Petersburg, the city of Petersburg is, I mean, there are schools where the number of non-African American students is so low they can't publish the data because it would violate FERPA regulations. Um, you can't diversify those school systems. So the question is, what do you do uh, when this, the entire school division is not diverse? Um, I, I happen to think that, that charter schools are, are a good idea, um, if that's what you meant by public school choice, um, partly because charter schools in most of the country are given the kind of flexibility to do some things that are outside the box. And I think that if you look at, at schools that are trying to address um, maybe non-diverse, I mean, at the end of the day, the question is, what do we do to make students um, to make students better prepared to take their place in 21st century, to be productive citizens, to be have a living, to, to have children, have a family, and, and do the sorts of things that we all want our children to do. Um, and I think that one of the things with, with charter schools is that the, the ones that are good, and the public school, the traditional public schools that are good, are the ones that bring in other resources uh, that help to replace the social capital that may not exist um, in, in, some of, in some of the communities. Um, there, there's, a, there's a traditional public school in, in, in Virginia, um, in it, probably about a 60% uh, Latino community. Um, the principal brought in the, the local community services people. The principal started an English language course for the parents. The, the principal started a pre-K program so that in that school for five hours a day you would have the parents, the pre-K student, and the, and, the K, and the third grader or fourth grader. And they suddenly became a family uh, environment 
that ensured that, that they began building on each other and, and, and helping each other. Uh, that's the sort of thing I think that, that charter schools can do. Traditional public schools can do them too. One of the things I think state boards have to do is to make certain that they give that kind of flexibility to local school systems and local schools to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. I think part of the issue we have in Virginia is that we dictate we dictate you, you have, have the money, but here's the money from the state, and here's how you have to spend it. Uh, and we, we too often spend it in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. I asked how much how much support we give to the concept of uh, extracurricular activities, which increasingly I'm coming to the conclusion, as, as Chris said, you know, if you've got kids involved in those kinds of activities, you've got kids that are, that are able to be involved in some other things. And our support amounts to a small percentage of the stipend, nothing in terms of equipment, nothing in terms of the larger stipend, and literally nothing. So if a school budget, a school district budget begins to be reduced, what are they going to cut? They're going to cut those things that are not part of the four core subjects. And that becomes the tragedy. It just starts Mm -hmm. spiraling downward. Thank you. Kim, did you want to jump in on this question? Uh, I would just say that um, even with socioeconomically diverse schools, we still, you know, we can't forget about racial um, disparities and racial discrimination. Um, Teachers and educators still need to be prepared um, to be culturally competent and sensitive to the students within that school community. I don't think we can afford to forget about that. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We have some questions. Let's see about this lady in the back right there. We guess that would be fine. My name is Shamoya Gardiner. I'm with the DC State Board of Education. And this question is for all of the panelists and Sammy. There are schools like Urban Prep in Chicago and Valor Academy of Leadership in Jacksonville that cater particularly to black males and have seen large rates of success. What do you have to say to those schools? Because this panel comes from a place that assumes that segregation is bad. Well, I think it's for all of you. Who wants to start? My, my view is that if what you're doing is successful, keep doing it, and if it's not successful, shut down. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, our obligation, as I said, is, is to make certain that students are productive citizens. Now, that frankly includes um, the, the ability to, to live and thrive in a diverse society and to understand uh, the impact of diversity and, and, the, and the positives it brings to life. Um, but I think that you know, we, we, we've talked a great deal about discipline, and, and uh, I had told you beforehand about an elementary school in, in Richmond where, where when new students come in, there is a spike in suspensions. Now, the principal is African-American, but the principal takes the view that, that, that this is, she calls the parents, she bothers the parents, the parents say, what are you calling me for? She says, because it's your child. They complain to the, to the school, the central administration. But after a period of time, it, it stops because the expectations are that we, will, we want good behavior in this school and we want academic excellence. Mm-hmm. And, and the, that school, which is 85, 80 to 85 percent free and reduced meals, their scores are 10 percentile points above any given demographic within the state. That's oh, fantastic. Um, Interesting. To me, that, that works. Yeah. Now, whether that will work at another school, I don't know. A lot of it has to do with, frankly, the individual leadership. Right. It works in that school because that leader fostered it. Yeah. Uh, it worked in the other school that brought in right. uh, all the other support right. mechanisms because that leader fostered it. Right. And that's what I mean when I say that state boards have to give that kind of yeah. flexibility. Yeah, good. I'm wondering if uh, Letitia and Kim, uh, do you have a response to the question that was asked about the uh, boarding schools? Did you say boarding or charter schools? Was it both? both? Oh, okay. Um, well, so one of the things that I mentioned earlier um, about NASB is that we're working with our states to kind of um, to take the lead on closing up opportunity and achievement gaps. And one of those things that um, one of the things that we believe they can do that's effective is raising awareness of best practices that are working in local districts and schools. So I think that districts that are, are schools that are homogeneous like that, racially homogeneous, um, should also be elevated as you know doing what works, and that. Um, best practices from those schools should be um, adhered to and, and pretty much like, I guess, applied to some of the districts and schools also in that state. Um, one of the things that we work with um, are 
state board members to do is to build statewide task forces that include representation from local districts, schools, communities, and and such. And so I would imagine that those schools and leaders in those schools should be at the table, should be talking about how, how what they're doing and, and what works for students, because I think that that can be applied to across the board for all students. Mm. Tisha, you want to jump in on this? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say I, I I don't want to misstate the end part of your question, but I heard you say something like we are coming at this from uh, segregation is a bad. Is that what you're saying? OK, so. Um, just we, we, I think we all appreciate in this room that schools today are even more segregated than public schools today are more segregated than they were at the time of Brown versus Board of Education, right? So we know that there are schools that are um, racially isolated, and I agree with everything that, that um, my co-panelists just said about ensuring that schools as they exist are high performing and high achieving and that students actually have access to meaningful educational opportunities within that context. At the same time, uh, I believe that it is imperative to ensure that students are able to go to school in diverse settings so that any effort to intentionally prevent that I think would be problematic. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that it's not, we, we understand the context that we're working within, and if something is working, that's wonderful. That's great. All right, that's great. We've, we're just about out of time. I'm going to give the Twitter folks another chance to redeem ourselves. Uh, is there a question? And that will probably be the last question. If we don't have a Twitter question, one more, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll break up. We do have one. Uh, would the panelists like to address access to effective teachers? What can urban schools do to attract and retain the best teachers? All right, a good question. I think that's one we have to answer. Uh, all right, the, why don't we, uh, who, who's, who's eager to jump in first, anybody? All right, it looks like you, I saw you reach for your mic, so okay, go for it. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that states need to look at is how they are spending, allocating funds um, from Title IA and Title IIA to support teachers that are in high need schools with high need students. Um, I don't believe enough money is going to professional development. I think that um, there is some room to kind of revisit that and maybe make some readjustments in that area. But um, that would be my suggestion. All right, cool. How about Chris, do you have a thought on this? No, I was gonna say, I, I, again, I spoke to a, to a principal who, who simply said, you know, I, I hire the, the teachers in my school, and, and I'm, looking for, I'm not looking for somebody who wants to come here to go to work. I'm looking for someone who wants to come here with a passion for a mission. And that's fine for that school. Um, problem is there probably aren't enough of them because, because there, there are too many schools that need the help. One of the things that, that she also pointed out to me, though, she allocates from her resources a ton of money for professional development that is not allocated from the school district or the state or anyone else. Um, it, is, it is a tragedy that we do that. And, we, and we, we, we take teachers that are brand new teachers and put them in the toughest schools. We don't, we don't have a pay differential that reflects um, working in challenged schools and trying to help in challenged schools. Yeah. And I think we need to figure out a way to do that, all of which is above our pay grade here, I think. Yeah, all right. I'm going, to let you I'm going to let you have the last word here, and then I think we're going to break okay. it up. I don't need the last one, but I'll just say quickly <laughs> that um, I, I agree with that. I think professional development is critical. Everyone can grow. Everyone can learn. Um, every, every school can stand to improve, regardless of whether or not it's at the top right now. Um, with respect to educators, uh, principals, I think it's imperative to understand that what works in one one school or one district may not work somewhere else. So you take an educator who's highly successful one place, they may face certain challenges if they were moved someplace else, perhaps to one of these other schools um, that, that is struggling. And so that's why the professional development piece is so critically important. And and you also may have be dealing with different um, demographics with respect to students and the com surrounding community. So... That's what I'll say. That's great. Well, I'd like to give a round of applause for our panelists and for Sammy for really an engaging conversation. And to thank them again, you did, you did a fantastic job. And I don't know if you all hang around for a little while. Maybe people have some questions. They want to talk to you. All right. Thanks so much.